put it over here. So good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship and welcome those that are tuning in on Facebook Live as well. Uh, next Sunday we have our soup and bread here. So we got uh, advertising posters up on that. Well, it's not here at Mabel. It's up at the, at the old school at the senior center. And it was 11 to 1. Is that the time? So I know we'll see more posts about that on Facebook and things throughout the week as well. Uh, so there will be lots of good soups and stuff to eat and we'll have a good time and we're going to go up there right after worship today and set some tables and get some organization done. Uh, with that, uh, our songs today are in the other songbook. The first hymn we're going to sing this morning is number two, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, hymn number two. Doesn't it work just to push start? Play. Play. Push yeah, song number one on there. So. Well, we had music earlier, so I mean, accompaniment earlier. We'll still have music. We'll just sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth he has no equal. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord, save up his name. From age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though his world with devils filled, should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours, through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this more 
immortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. For the day is printed in the bulletins. I invite you to join me as we come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Sovereign God, you turn your greatness into goodness for all the people on earth. Shape us into willing servants of your kingdom and make us desire always and only your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 12. It's a very familiar passage that we'll hear again now. Surely he took upon our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, this punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearer, shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. But oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living, from the transgressions of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes life a guilt offering, we see his offspring and, his pro and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. In the suffering of his whole soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressions. Here ends our first reading. Second reading is from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. And again, we're continuing, a, you know, a semi-continuous reading through the, through the New Testament book of Hebrews. And this talks about Jesus being the high priest, uh, just tying in a little bit with, with that first reading. Every high priest is selected from among God and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal greatly with, gently with those who are ignorant and who are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And in another place, you are a priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. 
Although he was a son, he learned obedience for what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Here ends our second reading. Our gospel reading is from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. I invite you to stand as you're comfortable standing. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. I'm going to talk about that, but he's, we're not very, we're only about a week uh, before the, the passion story of Jesus. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What would you want me to do for you? Jesus asked them. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup that I am about to, the, the cup that I am drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I baptize with. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not for me to grant. These places have been, belonged to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. But Jesus called them all together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Are we going to try that again? Doesn't want to work, huh? Okay. So, we're going to, uh, song number nine, His Beautiful Savior. Another familiar song, so I think we can sing that one a cappella as well. Um, hymn number nine in the other song. Beautiful Savior, King of creation, Son of God and Son of Man, truly I love Thee, truly I serve Thee, light of my soul.
my bulletin, I had I had the previous song crossed out, and then I had this song we just sang written in right along the sign where it said sermon. So I saw the offering was next. I thought, I get to skip the sermon today. <laughs> then I thought, well, maybe better not do that. <laughs> it just seemed, well, that doesn't seem like quite the right order for things when I was looking. But, uh, as I looked at the, the gospel text for today and, and read about James and John with their question, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. I thought, how often am I guilty of that? You know? Just saying to God, I want you to do this for me, God. You know, and and uh, Jesus says to James and John, do you really know what you're asking when they ask him, when they say that his, their request is to be seated at his right hand and at his left hand? And Jesus' response is, that's not for me to decide. But I want to back up and just kind of review a little bit of the center part of this Gospel of Mark. In, in Mark 8, 31, Mark 9, 31, and 10, 32. We didn't read the 10, 32 one. Jesus, three different times, reveals to his disciples about what's going to happen when they get to Jerusalem. They're on the road to Jerusalem. They started that journey, you know, in the early part of, of, of Mark 8. And along that journey, as they had just started out, Jesus encountered a blind man. And Jesus mixed some dirt with some of his saliva and he put it on this blind man's eyes and he said can you see and the blind man's response is well I can kind of see things kind of shadows right now and then Jesus healed him the second time and then he was able to completely completely and perfectly see right after that is when Jesus asked the disciples who do people say that I am and then who do you say that I am and Peter's confession you are the Christ and I think that this blind man the first healing when he couldn't quite see clearly is speaking a little bit about us and about an awful lot of people throughout history. You know, we, we don't really see things clearly. And Paul writes that, you know, we see things in a mirror dimly. You know, when Christ comes, we'll see things completely clearly. But right now we see things in a, dear, in a mirror dimly, a reflection. And, and as the disciples and Jesus continue their journey, when Jesus gets, you know, he, he heals a, a young boy and then he has the second prediction that people call it the prediction of his death. I like to think more of it as he's revealing what's going to happen because he knows what's going to happen. It's not a prediction. It's not a prophecy. Jesus knows what's going to happen. So he reveals a little bit more in the second time that he, that he tells his disciples, this is what we're gonna, what's going to happen when we get to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed, arrested, crucified and rise from the dead. And the disciples don't know quite how to react to that second one either. And as they're walking along the road to Jerusalem, they're talking among themselves and debating about who is going to be the greatest. You know, which one of them is going to be the greatest apostle? Which one is going to be the most important or whatever it might be? And Jesus asks them, what were you talking about? They don't really want to admit to Jesus that they were talking about who would be the greatest. And I think sometimes we get caught up in that as well, that we like to think of ourselves as a little bit better or at least not quite so bad. We like to have more people listen to us, think that we're an authority. And I know I like to be an authority, <laughs> you know? And it doesn't always work because I'm not always the authority. I'm very seldom am I ever the smartest person in a group of people. So Jesus is telling them again that you know, being great isn't what it's all about. You know, it's about serving others. And he says, you know, you need to come as a little child. You need to have this complete faith and trust. And then as we didn't read verses 32 through 34 in chapter 10 today, Jesus is much more explicit in his revelation as to what's going to happen when they get to Jerusalem. Just and as I said earlier, it's about a week before the Passion story. I'll just call it that, the betrayal, the regress to crucifixion and all of that. We're about one week before that as Jesus is talking with his disciples, traveling on, along this road. And the very next thing that happens in the gospel is our gospel reading for next Sunday, so I can't talk too much about that. But as they're walking along the road to Jericho, blind Bartimaeus hollers out, Jesus! You know, he hears who's walking there and he says, Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. 
And Jesus asks him, what would you have me do for you? The same, he, so Jesus asks blind Bartimaeus what he would have him do. Kind of the same question that James and John says, Master, we want you to do whatever we ask. And we know that James and John don't get that. We will, that Jesus, Jesus doesn't say that, I will do that. I will guarantee that you will sit at my right hand and my left hand. And as we think about the rest of the passion story, who ends up? at Jesus' right hand and left hand as he comes into his glory on the cross. Two thieves, one who acknowledges Jesus as Lord and Savior, as the Messiah, and the other who joins the crowd in mocking, in mocking the, the master. James and John didn't get their request. I don't think that they would have wanted to bend at Jesus' right hand and left hand when he came into his glory because they misunderstood so much of what God's glory in Jesus Christ was to be. They didn't understand yet, and it's just like that, you know, that blind man that was healed before the first revelation of the passion story. They didn't see and they didn't understand. And, and I wonder yet today, how much, how much don't we see? I mean, I know, I know we don't understand an awful lot, but what don't we see in our world today? When I think of mission, or maybe I should ask you first, when you think of mission, with the church's mission, what comes to your mind? What comes to my mind is these poor people somewhere else out in the world that have never heard of Jesus, you know, or, you know over in Africa or in Asia or South America or somebody. That's, that's my first impression of mission. But our mission as church is to witness to God, to witness our faith in our daily lives, right where we are. And so sometimes, I mean, I don't like to think of mission as, as being in, you know, even Minneapolis-St. Paul. I and mean, we've done mission trips there with kids. And I've seen some things that have really opened my eyes and opened their eyes. I don't really think of mission as being in Fargo or Grand Forks or Bismarck or Jamestown or Glenfield or McHenry or Sutton or Courtney. But those are mission fields. And... You know, this is where God would have us being a, being a witness. This is where God would have us being the servant because Jesus said in today's gospel, you know, it's not about, it's not about being served. It's about serving. And that's, that's such a hard thing for us because we don't want to be that one that's the lowest on the totem pole. And, you know, the... Uh, but James and John want to, want to have these places of, of power and authority. They want to be the ones that are like vice president and second vice president giving the orders. But Jesus says that that's not what we are about. We are about serving. We are about helping others. We are about seeing the needs of the community. These disciples, James and John and Peter, especially Peter, they were bold, they were brash, they were filled with confidence. They were certain that Jesus was going to set up this earthly kingdom. You know, they didn't understand. They were blind to the fact that the kingship of Jesus wasn't the kingship of this earth. But they were, as I said, bold and brash and confident that Jesus was going to lead them in a new direction and set up this kingdom on earth. And they wanted to be the special ones. They wanted to be noticed. They wanted people to sit up and hear them and listen to them. And Jesus said, if you want them to do that, you must empty yourself. You must give up some of those high expectations of everybody just clinging to every word that you say and rather experience that you do the most good when you act as a servant, when you help others, when you see their needs, when you open yourself. Jesus is the greatest example of that, I think, to us that we've ever seen. He came, he came down from heaven. We sing that, we talk about that. He gave up his throne to become a little child that we rejoice at Christmas time when he's born. But even at Christmas time, when we Celebrate the birth of our Lord. We are like that first blind man and after that first healing. We don't really see 
or understand the whole picture. And I don't think that our vision will be completely, completely restored until we leave this life behind. We just, I mean, we just can't see everything that God would have for us. We can't see the magnitude of his love. We, we get glimpses of it and we understand it to a certain point. But to totally empty ourselves, to totally give ourselves to the benefit and the blessing of others is, is I think, beyond any of our ability. But that's what Jesus would have us do, to be the slave, to be the servant of all. There's no honor in being a slave. There's no honor in being the servant. I think about when Jesus went to Mary and Martha's house and, and uh, and Lazarus as well was their brother. But, and, and Mary came and sat at Jesus' feet. And Martha was taken up with serving. And at that point, Jesus says that Mary has chosen the better thing, to sit and to listen to Jesus' words. Well, Martha was content to worry about serving, to being the one that was making sure everything was done right and properly. And everybody had enough food. Everybody had what they needed. I like to read about Jesus. I like to study and I like to hear his words. And it's a lot easier to just read them and, and think about them than it is to, to preach about them. And for me, that's a part of, that's the, one of the hard parts of being the servant of Jesus, is to not only read the words that he says to us, to read the words of the Bible, but to figure out how to try to bring a message of hope, a message of salvation, a message of comfort. When we in the world experience so much pain and so much agony and so much uncertainty, we've got so many people in our community that lives are turned upside down. How do we serve them? How do we help them? How do we reach out to them? How do we reach out to the people in our community that maybe don't take time for worship on Sunday mornings? You know, we're, we're sitting here, standing here in this church building, in this little town out in the middle of North Dakota. And there will be probably other cars that will drive by as we're having worship service. And those other cars that will drive by or those other people that see our vehicles here understand and know that we are here because God is important to us. And just by coming here on a Sunday morning, we are being servants to them. Even though we may not realize it, even they, though they may not realize it, we are witnessing our faith that God is important enough for us to take time out to come. And that by coming here today, by having our vehicles parked outside, by preparing for having a meal next Sunday and inviting the community to come, we are being servants of the community. We are reaching out with God's word, and that's what God would have us do. So sometimes being a servant of God isn't maybe quite as hard as we think it is to give up our time to come. Somebody the other day asked Cheryl, what time is worship in Sutton? And she says, nine o'clock, and I said, ooh. And then Cheryl said, but they'll tell you it used to be 8.30. <laughs> and, you know, so we, we, <laughs> Nine o'clock is, you know, it's not so awfully early, but, 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 you know, when you tell people we get together at nine o'clock for worship, it's just kind of, ah, you know, but, but we come, we take that time out of our lives. We, we, we spend that little bit of time with God. And I saw a post the other day on Facebook and it asked, well, how many of you have a, a, a real Bible? Not just on your phone, but how many of you have a, a, you know, a, bio, a printed out Bible? And one person's answer, and do you read it or do you use it? And, and one person's response was, yes, I have one and I take it with me every Tuesday to Bible study. And, and I'm thinking, good, I mean, you're using your Bible, you know, and if you're taking it with you on Tuesday to Bible study, you're probably looking at it some other times as well. But it, it's one of those things that, you know, just we don't think that much about what we do sometimes and how what we do can reflect on others. 
And so just by coming to worship this morning, we are showing the people of our community, we are being a servant of God just by coming to worship this morning. And so I make, it makes me wonder what other simple and easy ways can we witness our faith? I'm not going to give you answers. I'm going to let you think about that. But we do it in so many times, in so many ways. And when you're out for a meal in a restaurant, um, how often do you look around and notice that somebody at the table next to you is praying? Or are people at another table able to see you pray over your meal when you go out that way? Just little things that make us servants of others. Little things that others see God in us and through us. And that's what Jesus is saying. We don't need to be the vice president or the second vice president. We don't need to people be the people in, in high authority. We need to be the people that others see Jesus in us. Let's pray. Gracious God, sometimes we want to be in the spotlight. Sometimes we want to be the hero. But most often, for most of us, we like to just kind of be in the background and let others take a leadership role. And yet we don't think of ourselves as being leaders of our faith, being teachers of our faith, but we do it in so many ways, often in ways that we don't really recognize. So help us to continue to live lives that, that reflect our faith. Help us to be servants. Help us to hear the, the needs of others in our community. Help us to know as a church that our mission is not only around the whole world, but right here in our home community. Sometimes, and most often, even right in our own families. So help us to be your witnesses. Help us to live as a servant. Help us to be Jesus to those around us. We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Our offering remains in the narthex of the church. We sing our offering response. We give thee but thine own. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. The communion liturgy is printed in our bulletins. Um, we will take time for that now. Come, all who are loved by God, come to his table. We come to eat, to drink, and our hearts are glad. We remember the way that Jesus showed us his love. On the evening before he died, he had supper with his friends. During that meal, he took the loaf of bread. He gave thanks for it. He broke it. And then he passed it around with these words. This is my body broken for you. Eat this and remember me. And after the meal, he took a cup of wine. And he gave thanks for it and passed it around with these words. This is my blood shed for you. Drink this and remember me. We take your wafer. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Your sins are entirely and completely forgiven in Jesus' name, and may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Our prayers today, I've been asked to include Tiffany Dick and her family in our prayers, to include Nikki Stucka in our prayers, and Brad Barnes in our prayers in addition to those that we've been praying for. Are there any other requests this morning? Our daughter Jennifer, she had a concussion this week. Okay. Oof. Is she doing okay? She's doing okay. She can't go back to work yet until she's cleared from the doctor. 
Okay. Let's bow our heads and unite our hearts in prayer. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you for giving Jesus to us to be an example of how to love, to be an example of how to serve, to be an example of how to treat other people and welcome other people, to hear as other people call out to him. Help us to hear the needs of our community and of the world. Help us to respond to them with grace, with mercy, and with words of promise. We pray for our country, Lord God. There is so much unrest and uncertainty and so many things going on that, that we hear in the news. And we, we ask that, that our leaders would work together for the good of our country and that we, the people of this United States of America, would would join together and work together as well to be united, to be united as one people. And that we would be united with you as our Lord God. As we, we have the words in our, you know, one nation under God, help us to be that one nation. Help us to all acknowledge you as Lord God. We give you thanks for all who serve in the military, police officers, firefighters, doctors, nurses, so many that give themselves of themselves for the sake of community. Watch over them and give them strength. Keep them strong and bless them with safe returns home from times of danger. And as we pray for those around us who need your healing touch, Lord God, we, we give you thanks for all the miracles of modern medicine and continue to pray for those who do research that they may continue to find new medications that will heal and bring pain relief and healing in the midst of suffering. Today we continue to pray for Mandy, David, Brock, Terry, for Dean, for Duane and Elna. And we add to our prayers today Tiffany Dick and her family as they face some decisions in the days ahead. Give them your strength and guidance. We pray for Nikki Stucka that you would extend your hand of healing. We pray for Brad Barnes, that the doctors will be able to determine a, a way to get his heart working properly again. Pray for Jan for peace of mind and for their family as well. And that so often, Lord, when we pray, we pray for specific individuals. We also need to remember and pray for their families, for the strength, for the confidence, to be positive in so many ways, because having a positive attitude helps so much. We pray for Jennifer, that her concussion will, uh, as she's been cleared that way, that, that she will just have no other problems from that. that She'll be able to return safely to work. And we pray for our farmers who work the fields. And now with the rains that have blessed the earth, they have another thing to contend with, you know, to watch out for the mud and all that, but it's a part of farming. It's a part of their lives, a part of their livelihood. So bless them and watch over them as they continue the harvest and provide food for the country. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On this day and always, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. We're going to try that clapping over again. <laughs> See if we get number 16, Blessed Assurance is our closing hymn. Number 16 in the other songbook. We'll see if it, the shaking of the head, that just doesn't look so good. You know? well, anyway, we tried again with the music today. And 
So we will sing Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above Echoes of mercy, whispers of love This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.